In the previous video, we talked about Legendre polynomials and solving Legendre's differential equation. In this video, we're going to solve ODEs using a slightly modified series solution method called the Frobenius method. Recall that for power series solutions, the general linear differential equation given by y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equals r of x only had a valid series solution about x equals x naught if p, q, and r had valid Taylor series expansions about x equals x naught, meaning that they had to be continuously differentiable around that point. But what if p, q, and r didn't have valid Taylor expansions at x naught? but I still wanted a series solution that was centered around x0. What if I was really stubborn? Well, I could still do it, provided that I make a slight modification to my solution and that my p, q, and r weren't too undefined at x equals x0. You'll see what I mean by that soon enough. All I need to do is include an x to the r term to the regular series solution, where r is some real number. And this is called the Frobenius method. But actually, though, why would I do something like that? Why don't I just save myself the trouble of having an extra r power in there and just use a power series solution but around another point where I don't encounter these singularity problems? Well, there's a problem with that. If I have an ODE, you know, the same one as the one above, with a regular series solution around x0, then the radius of convergence r of my solution, which is indicative of how well it converges, is at least equal to the minimum of the radii of convergence of the power series corresponding to p, q, and r. This result is known as Fuchs' theorem. I know it's tempting to mispronounce it or even misspell it, but this is a family show. Anyway, why is Fuchs' theorem relevant? If, for example, my ODE was y double prime minus 2 over xy prime plus 1 over x squared y equals 0, then since p is undefined at 0, and so is q, we're not worried about r of x here since that's 0, I could have my solution be a series centered around x not equal 1. In that case, when solving my ODE, the radii of convergence of p and q are both 1. Why? Well, it's because the nearest singular or undefined point is at x equals 0. So the radius of convergence becomes limited by the distance between the point I'm expanding around, which is x equals 1, and the nearest singular point, which is x equals 0. So because of Fuchs' theorem, my solution y of x will at least have a radius of convergence of 1, if it's taken as a series expansion about x not equal to 1. On the other hand, if I use Frobenius's method, I can still have my solution be a power series about x equals 0, where p and q are both undefined. As long as x not equals 0 is a regular singular point of the ODE, and that's where I get into the difference between something being a little undefined and something being very undefined. Now what do I mean by a regular singular point? Here's what I mean. x0 is a regular singular point of the ODE, y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equals 0, if x minus x0 times p of x has a valid Taylor expansion about x equals x0, and x minus x0 whole squared times q of x has a valid Taylor expansion about x0. If x0 is regular singular, then we can use Frobenius's method with a series solution centered at x0. Now here's where the advantage of using Frobenius's method comes in. If x0 equals 0 is a regular singular point for this particular ODE, then the radius of convergence of the solution y of x by Frobenius's method, instead of being at least 1, it becomes infinity. Because there's no other singular point for p of x and q of x, at least in this example. And that's the benefit of using Frobenius's method. Having a solution expanded about the regular singular point effectively masks the singularity at that point and allows the solution to be valid for a larger range of x than it would if you were to expand around another point using a regular series solution. So let's take another example and try to solve it using Frobenius's method. Something like 2 times x minus 1 whole squared y double prime minus x minus 1 times y prime plus y equals 0. The first step here is to find the regular singular points. How we do that is we begin by dividing the entire ODE by the coefficient of the second derivative term in order to convert it to a quote-unquote standard form. And this is what we have. 2y double prime minus 1 over x minus 1y prime plus 1 over x minus 1 whole squared y equals 0. Now let's check for regular singular points. 
clearly we can see that because of the x minus 1 term in the denominators over here, x equals 1 would make these expressions undefined. So it's definitely a singular point, but is it regular singular? Well, checking that is pretty easy. We compare it to the more general ODE up here, then we can see that p of x is negative 1 over x minus 1, while q of x is 1 over x minus 1 whole squared. And if we multiply p of x by x minus 1, then we clearly end up with negative 1. If we multiply q of x by x minus 1 whole squared, we'll end up with 1. And both of these are defined, and thus have valid Taylor series expansions at x equals 1. They're just constants. So according to what we said earlier, x equals 1 is indeed a regular singular point, which means we can definitely use Frobenius' method with a power series expanded around x equals 1. In that case, we can propose a solution given by the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times x minus 1 to the n plus r. Now, unlike the regular series solution method where the only unknown was a n, the Frobenius method now has two unknowns, a n and r. I'm going to show you how to solve for both of them, but first we'll need to take two derivatives of y and substitute them into the ODE. The first derivative is just the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of n plus r times a n times x minus 1 to the n plus r minus 1. You just get this by moving the power down and reducing it by 1. Pretty simple. We can do that again to get the second derivative. Now let's substitute all of this into our differential equation. We'll get 2 times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of n plus r times n plus r minus 1 times a n times x minus 1 to the n plus r minus 2 minus 1 over x minus 1 times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of n plus r times a n times x minus 1 to the n plus r minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1 whole squared times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times x minus 1 to the n plus r. And all of that equals 0. It's pretty easy to simplify this since everything is in terms of x minus 1. All we have to do is stick the x minus 1s into the summations. For the y prime term, or the second term in this equation, sticking the x minus 1 into the sum will just reduce the power of the x minus 1 inside the sum by 1. Similarly, sticking the x minus 1 whole squared into the third term here will reduce the power by 2, and this is what we end up with. Now, this is really convenient. All the powers on the x minus 1 term in the summations are the same and all the summations start from n equals 0. That means we can immediately combine everything without carrying out any intermediate steps like we did last time. If we expand out the first few terms in this summation, here's what we'll have. 2 times r times r minus 1 minus r plus 1 times a naught times x minus 1 to the power r minus 2. This is for n equals 0. And then plus 2r times r plus 1 minus r plus 1 plus 1 times a1 times x minus 1 to the r minus 1 for n equals 1, and then so on. Since the right-hand side is completely 0, all the coefficients on the left-hand side must also be 0. So let's look at the first coefficient, the one for the n equals 0 term. This is a quadratic equation in terms of r. In the context of the Frobenius method, it's also called the indicial equation. Let's solve this equation. If we expand out the first term and simplify, we'll get 2r squared minus 3r plus 1 equals 0. And after applying the quadratic formula or using whatever technique you want to solve this equation, we'll find that the roots are r equals 1 and 0 0.5. Now let's take these roots and substitute them back into the equality we had here for the series coefficients. Well, you'll find that for the coefficient of a0, it'll just be 0. But for the coefficient a1, you'll find that it won't be 0. For r equals 1, the term in front of a1 will be 1, and for r equals 0 0.5, it'll be 1 as well. In fact, if we plug these values of r into all the other terms in the series, we won't have 0, but because all the coefficients of this series must be 0 for the equality to hold, we must have a1, a2, a3, and so on. We must have all of those guys equal 0. What does this mean for our final answer? Well, if we take our y of x from earlier, then only the first term, the term corresponding to n equals 0, will be there, since everything else is just 0, so our y of x will just be a0 times x minus 1 to the r. Because there's two values of r, that means we'll have one solution be y1 equals a0 times x minus 1, and the other solution be y2, which is a0 times x minus 1 to the power 0.5. So the general solution to this ODE will just be a linear combination of these two individual basis solutions, which is another name for them. And there you have it. That's the solution to the ODE in our example. 
Notice that I didn't even need to go through a recursive relation because the an coefficients in the series weren't even related to each other. They were just largely independent quantities. This isn't always the case with the Frobenius method because the ODEs we typically have to solve are rather complicated, especially when the roots of the indicial equation are repeated or they differ by an integer, which they didn't in this example. That stuff, though, is something we'll leave for the next video. Before I go, let me note something important that might be a cause for confusion. The indicial equation I got up here was derived by assuming the coefficient a0 was not zero, and then setting the quadratic function in front of it to be zero. In reality, it doesn't matter which term I get my indicial equation from. We just pick a0 because it happens to be easier. For instance, if I got it from, say, the a1 term right here, then the only difference would have been that my r's would have been offset by 1. In other words, the solution would have been 0 and negative 0 0.5 instead of 1 and 0 0.5. In the end, my final answer wouldn't have actually been any different because now instead of only having a non-zero a0 term, I would have only had a non-zero a1 term. Since the a1 term is already multiplying x minus 1 to the r plus 1, the offset in my value of r that occurred because of choosing a different indicial equation would have been nullified. And so the answer I would have gotten for y of x would have still had a linear combination of x minus 1 and the square root of x minus 1.